They were newlyweds, building a life together in the Missouri countryside. It was a beautiful wedding. She was a beautiful bride. He, he really loved that girl. She was the best thing that ever happened to my son. Until they both vanished in the dead of night. There was an immediate smell of either bleach or some type of strong uh, cleaner. You could tell that something had happened in there. The investigation would uncover a volatile family secret and a deadly feud decades in the making. The investigators had found letters between the two of them expressing her frustration. I knew his background, and I knew what he was capable of. And I thought, oh, my word. Monday, April 18th, 2011. It's a cool spring evening in the tiny town of Willard, Missouri. And 26-year-old Jessica Hill is driving to her mother Becky Porter's farmhouse to check on her. The weekend before, it was hard to get a hold of my mom. We kind of played phone tag back and forth. I finally got a hold of her. And she told me she had been sick, that she couldn't hardly lift her head off the pillow. And I told her she needed to go to the hospital. She said if she didn't feel better the next morning, she would go. And that was the last time I spoke to her. On April 18th, I had went to work just like any other day. When I got off work, I began to call her, and I could never reach her. At that point, I decided to drive about an hour up to her house to go check on her. As soon as Jessica arrives, she can tell something isn't right. Her car was in the driveway. There were a couple lights on in the house. So I got out of my car and I walked up to the back door, which is where they would normally go in. The back door was completely open. The screen door was shut. And this is at midnight. And people don't leave their doors wide open at midnight, especially out in the country. So I stood at the door and I hollered for her. And I never got an answer. She was concerned and didn't want to go in based on the way the, the entrance to the home looked to her. So she immediately called law enforcement. Forty-six-year-old Becky Porter has only been living in the farmhouse for a little over a year. But for her new husband, 32-year-old Rusty Porter, it's the place where he grew up. As a child, he was independent. He had three sisters, so um, he had four mothers. <laughs> His dad was a truck driver, so he was gone most of the time. And uh, so it was basically uh, me and the four kids. He was always wanting to do anything that would go fast. He liked vehicles and cars and, and uh, motorcycles. Rusty got interested in rebuilding motors and racing cars. And uh, as he got older and away from home, he got into um, the Five Off, Five On program in South Carolina, where the NASCAR drivers are. He worked on the pit crew. He said it was very tense, and, and uh, he, he kind of liked the adrenaline thrill of it. Unfortunately, Rusty's career in racing would be cut short. He was in a lot of pain most of the time. His arms started going numb, and then one of his legs started going numb. And they finally uh, figured out that he had a cyst in his uh, spinal cord at the base of his brain. Most of his jobs were all physical work, and his back would not let him do a lot of that. So Russell was learning how to work on computers. Computers would provide Rusty with more than just a new job. He and Becky met on a dating site in December of 2008. Rusty was very impressed with the Mustang that she drove, as well as she was a beautiful girl. He's telling me about this nice car that she had. She wanted to put some 
racing stripes on it, and he helped her with that, and uh, it blossomed from there. With her two children grown, Becky was looking for love after divorcing her husband of 26 years. Mom and dad met whenever they were in high school. They were high school sweethearts. My mom had two kids, me and my brother. Um, she was 20 when she had me. And then right after her and my dad divorced, well, they hadn't even actually divorced yet, she met Rusty. The two helped each other through their difficult transitions. And in 2010, the couple tied the knot. He really loved that girl. And uh, she done a lot to uh, strengthen him and give him fortitude and uh, encourage him. Becky was the best thing that ever happened to my son. Becky had never had a big wedding, so she was excited. She wanted a, a balloon rainbow behind the cake. And uh, man, we never, never blew so many balloons in my life. It was beautiful. Everything was beautiful. Rusty's mother gave the newlyweds the farmhouse and the land around it as a gift. It was the old farmhouse that I grew up in. I lived in a double wide trailer behind it. It was way out in the country, uh, rolling hills. It was really beautiful. Rusty and Becky were very excited about it. They went to work on the house to, to make it permanently theirs. Their church had come and helped them get set up there, I think had, had painted and, and, you know, just done some things for them to kind of get them a fresh start. Now, 10 months after their wedding, instead of living happily ever after, they've both suddenly disappeared. We had no idea where Rusty and Becky was. The police and the sheriff's department and everything came in and they immediately got a search warrant. Obviously, time is ticking, and they were asking themselves, where did they go? Why would they have left? And I think it became pretty clear to our investigators in this case that something wasn't right. Coming up, police discovered that the Porter's marriage wasn't everything it appeared to be. They found letters with mom expressing her frustrations and angers towards Rusty. Newlyweds Rusty and Becky Porter have mysteriously vanished from their farmhouse in Missouri. Authorities with the Greene County Sheriff's Office have been sent to find out what happened. Initially, this was a missing persons call, um, but after they spoke with Jessica, they quickly realized that something wasn't right. They went in, there was an immediate smell of either bleach or some type of industrial cleaner of some sort. At first, I didn't think anything of it because my mom was a clean person. She used bleach to clean all the time, so I just figured she had been cleaning that day. Everything seemed pretty normal until you got into their bedroom. The bed had been moved off the box springs. The mattress had been moved. Her purse was on the floor. Her cell phone was up against the wall on the floor. There was a broken picture. You could tell that something had happened in there. In my mom's purse, her driver's license was in there, her wallet, all of her credit cards, money. So it, it wasn't a robbery. I mean, you could tell because everything valuable was still at the house. There aren't too many good reasons why a person would leave their purse and cell phone and be gone for however long it had been at that point. They'd already been having communication about Rebecca not feeling well. That was completely not normal, and that was a red flag, too, that something obviously had happened. She wasn't obviously expecting to leave her home, and their vehicles were there, too. Their cell phone was there. Their shoes were there. The keys were in the car. There was a screen that was cut. You just had this feeling. Potentially, they've been taken is what it looked like. As investigators search the property for further clues, they make a promising discovery. They did notice that there were security cameras at Rusty and Rebecca's home. It wasn't until after they were missing that I found out about the security cameras. Prior to that, I didn't know anything about them. 
Unfortunately, any recordings the cameras might have made appear to be missing. They went into the office area, and they noticed that the hard drives and the computers were taken. And those would have been what were attached to the security cameras. So any feed that would have come off of that um, was now gone. Combined with the hasty cleaning attempt, it looks like whoever took the porters wanted to make sure they covered their tracks. As detectives examine the crime scene, the family begins an investigation of their own. The night that we discovered that they were missing, I had to stay at the house um, because then I was considered a suspect. So it wasn't until they cleared me as a suspect that I could leave the perimeter. The sheriff brought his horse posse and they searched the 120 acres. There were multiple helicopters searching the property. They didn't really find anything. The first couple of days, we just sit there, just watching them with the investigation. And I knew we had to do something. So the local sheriff had told me to contact a lady named Janice. She had an organization that helped search for missing people. So we contacted her, and immediately we had missing flyers put up. All of Becky's family, all of my family, everybody was putting up flyers all around store buildings and everywhere. The immediate fear that you felt, along with the hope and prayers that nothing was wrong, was horrific. We drove up and down the interstate. We went to campgrounds. I had people from other states putting them up. I felt like I couldn't help with the investigation, but that's something that I could do. Meanwhile, detectives have come across evidence that could take the case in a new direction. The investigators had found letters between the two of them uh, with mom expressing her frustrations and angers towards Rusty. They had some financial issues. You know, Rusty had a back injury, which caused him to where he couldn't work. And I know that put a lot of a burden on my mother. I think Rusty, due to some circumstances and his back problems, I hate to admit it, but I think he was a very depressed individual. He would never let on that it was, but I think depression was, was with him a lot. Law enforcement had to kind of go down that route to say, hey, is this possibly something where we've had uh, an issue between the couple and something has gone awry, you know, and Rusty has done something? All they're seeing is Rebecca's stuff in the bedroom. So they're not sure if this was an abduction of just her, if the husband was involved, if he was abducted with her. There were a lot of questions at that point. When mom went missing, I thought it was Rusty that had something to do with it. Mom may have been good for Rusty, but that's because he took everything from her. I mean, he didn't work. It's not this perfect love story that everybody makes it out to be. Coming up, as investigators shift their focus, another violent crime strikes this rural community. The chances of something like that happening twice in that short period, it's just, it's got to be connected. A week into the search for missing newlyweds Becky and Rusty Porter, Missouri police have begun to question the state of their relationship. Before investigators can pursue the theory any further, another case steals their attention. Seven miles away from the Porter's farm, an elderly couple, Don and Helen Willingham, are found stabbed to death in their home. When I had heard about the Willinghams being murdered, my, my first my first thought was it, it's got to be some some way connected. That was especially concerning because it seemed like a big coincidence to have two couples in close proximity just a few days apart uh, in a small community like that. Neighbors had spotted a suspect fleeing the scene, but key differences between the two crimes quickly emerge. It really, it, it did give me hope at first. And then I, I quickly realized that it was just a more of a burglary 
type of a murder and not really a kidnapping. Someone just came to their house. They didn't know who it was. It was just a random act. Days later, police arrest 23-year-old Jose Huckleberry in connection with the Willingham murders. But when they ask him about the Porter's whereabouts, he confirms their growing doubts. Jose Huckleberry was arrested for the murder of the Willinghams, and he gave a full confession, but he denied having any involvement in the disappearance of the Porters. Investigators' theories about Rusty Porter's involvement also lose steam. Once law enforcement spoke with people that knew them, it was pretty clear pretty quickly that that was not something that really had any credibility to it. Like any newlywed couple, they had their problems financially and all, but from what I knew, they were they were a couple. You got to remember, she was divorced. Russell had children by another lady. They were just trying to put their lives together to make something of it. I do honestly believe that he loved her very much. When investigators sit down with Becky's son, Corey, he tells them there is one person who might want to get rid of the couple. This one time, it was during the winter prior to her disappearance, she kind of started breaking down and crying about some things that had been going on. She had told me that there had been threats made against her and Rusty from Rusty's uncle, Robert Campbell. My brother lived up on the north end of the farm. He lived on the upper 60 acres and I lived on the lower 60 acres. So my kids would inherit the 60 acres that I lived on, and his kids would inherit the land that he lived on. But my brother was not happy that my son was gonna inherit uh, the farmhouse. The fact that his sister allowed his nephew to live there and his new wife, and it got fixed up and was real nice, you know, I think there was just a lot of bad blood there between him and Rusty about that. There was a squabble over the old detached garage that Rusty felt it was his and had stuff in it, and, and Robert thought it was his, and he didn't think Rusty had any right to lock it, and he went down and broke the lock. There was one point she told me how she got up in his face screaming at him. And I told her, I said, you can't do that. I said, you know, there's some people that they're not going to stand for it. They'll just end up shooting you. Part of the reason that they believed that the cameras were put up by Rusty was just a general concern about Robert and his behavior and his threats. Police discovered that the land wasn't the only thing Robert and the Porters fought over. Apparently, Robert Campbell was dealing with some stolen property, some stolen four-wheelers and tractors. Mom would see all these stolen properties coming in. She knew they wasn't supposed to be there, so she would call the cops on Robert Campbell, and that was a big problem between the two of them. Is it possible Robert finally made good on his threats? To find out, investigators bring him in for a formal interview. Robert Campbell was not surprised that his nephew went missing, nor did he care to come home to be with family to help them find him. He was very clear from the beginning with law enforcement that he had nothing to do with this case. And in fact, he had been out of the state. He drove a truck and he evidently was in Texas at the time the porters went missing. He had receipts. I mean, he had, he had, you know, his log book. He had all kinds of meal receipts, everything. I mean, he was covered. Yet another suspect seems to have been cleared. And still, investigators are no closer to understanding what happened to Becky and Rusty Porter. It was a very hard time. I, I had honestly thought that maybe they had entered into like a witness protection program or something to where they're being kept safe somewhere or, or something. I, I never lost hope that my mother was still alive. It was aggravating. You know, we wanted answers and we wanted them right then and there. The farmhouse is the only piece of evidence in the case until one night, it suddenly goes up in flames. 
There was really not a lot of answers as to how it caught fire or why it caught fire. My first thought was somebody was covering their tracks. Coming up, an unexpected tip takes the case in a new direction. I'm thinking, how could this person have something to do with my mom and Rusty? Becky and Rusty Porter's one-year wedding anniversary has come and gone, and the couple remains missing. Now, the farmhouse they lovingly renovated has burned to the ground. I found the burning down of their home very suspicious, and it was very weird that it was just thought, being a vacant house, it would just burn down. The fire marshals were searching for a reason for the fire, so over the refrigerator that was in the kitchen, they found some wires that looked kind of burned. I had moved down to the farmhouse in about 06 and had done a bunch of remodeling as well as rewiring everything in that house. So I don't see how that can be, but that's what they determined was that it was probably faulty wiring. While Rusty's mother recovers from this latest blow, she does everything she can to keep the search alive. A friend of mine that ran the paper there in Willard, she did several interviews and write-ups uh, almost every week on Rusty and Becky, and, you know, just to keep them in the limelight. I mean, it was all over the TV. Investigators actually had a lead hotline dedicated to this case where they had numerous, numerous leads from, you know, anonymous calls, and they would follow every single lead. In June of 2011, two months after the newlyweds were reported missing, one of those leads takes investigators to a prison in Greene County. An inmate claims that a man named Tony Friend had been bragging about his involvement in the Porter's disappearance. Tony had made some comments to him about taking two birthdays, and that was the magic words for taking their lives. Tony had a pretty long criminal record and yeah. had a past with violence and, and guns and, and drugs. And in my mind, I, I'm thinking, how could this person have something to do with my mom and Rusty? It doesn't take detectives long to find a connection. Tony Friend was the brother of Robert Campbell's wife, Carolyn. I knew his background, and I knew what he was capable of. And so whenever word started circling, then, of course, I put two and two together, and I thought, oh, my word. But I still did not expect my brother to have anything to do with it because he and I had always been close growing up. He, he was my protector. I mean, it, it, it just didn't make sense. With Tony Friend now the prime suspect, investigators want to speak with him right away. They quickly learn that Tony and Wendy have already been arrested for separate drug charges. Tony Friend and his wife, Wendy, were both in jail. So investigators went to talk to them, and they both denied any knowledge of the Porter's disappearance. Investigators realized that on the night of the disappearances, the friends had been communicating frequently with their son, Philip, and another person. You have not only Tony Friend, who happens to be Robert Campbell's brother-in-law, but you also have Wendy Friend, who was his wife. You also have Tony Friend's son, Philip Friend. You also have Philip Friend's cousin, Dusty Hicks. They started charting and tracking where all the phones were going, and you could actually see the trail um, from Willard through Greene County, down through Christian County, down to Taney County. Taney County is an area a few miles east of Branson and at least an hour or more from Willard. And the, the area we're talking about is, is a very large wooded 
area, remote, fairly sparsely populated. Investigators fear the location is an ideal place for a killer to dump a body. They immediately set out to search the remote area. It went through my mind that we'll never find him. I've read articles on people that uh, are still missing today, how many thousand people have never been found. It was several weeks later, in fact, it was on July 21st, that investigators finally came across an abandoned cabin in the Cedar Creek area. And at this abandoned cabin is where they located the bodies of Rusty and Becky Porter. They had been there for months. I mean, we're talking April to July of that same year. That was the most devastating news I have ever received in my life. It's very disturbing news, and, and yet you're thankful that after three and a half months that, that they were found. Jim Farrell was the detective that came. We were personal friends. We all had gone to church together. And whenever he sat there and told me that there were a couple bodies that had been found in the Mark Twain National Forest around Cedar Creek, I, my immediate thought was Tony Friend. That's where he's from. He grew up there. He was very familiar with the area down there. Coming up, the truth behind the porter's disappearance finally comes out. I knew that something was going on, because why would they want to do something to Rusty if they didn't even know it? After three and a half months, the search for a missing couple has ended in the forests of Missouri. Autopsies confirmed that the bodies belong to newlyweds, Rusty and Becky Porter. The medical examiner also reveals disturbing details about the couple's death. The porters uh, had been evidently shot through the head. And from the angle, it appeared that uh, they probably had been kneeling. So it appeared they had been taken into the woods and just shot execution style. Now authorities need to figure out who killed the porters and what did they have to gain from their deaths? Detectives interview the four suspects, hoping to find out. Tony and Wendy Friend and Dusty Hicks evidently did not cooperate with investigators at all. But another suspect, uh, Tony Friend's son, Philip, did. Facing the possibility of life in prison, Philip Friend decides to come clean. On December 17, 2012, he tells police that his father approached him with a business proposition. We had found out during the investigation that Robert Campbell had offered Tony Friend $100,000 for two birthdays. Two birthdays is taking the lives of people, my mom and Rusty. On the night of their disappearance, they had all met at Robert Campbell's house. Tony, his wife, Wendy, his son, Philip and then their cousin, Dusty. They had all had kind of a pre-meeting, so to speak, to kind of plan out what they were going to do. They were going to pull up to the house and make it look like a robbery gone bad. The men, all wearing masks, walked down the road to Mom and Rusty's house while Wendy stayed behind in the truck. They were trying to find a way to get into the house. They noticed that a window was open, so they cut the screen on the window. They made their way through the house to their bedroom. When they got to mom's room, they flipped the lights on and they told him to get out of bed. My mom was begging for them not to hurt them. They said that she was so scared. They ended up zip tying the back of their hands and walking them out of the house in nothing but their pajamas. They told them to stay calm. They put something on their mouths so that they wouldn't scream or yell. And they took them to Tony Friend's truck. 
dusty, ended up pouring bleach all over the house. And so Philip confirmed that they had done that on purpose because one of them had thought that that would cover up evidence. They dropped off Wendy in Springfield. Uh, they drove down to the Cedar Creek area. And apparently at that point, Tony took the porters out of the truck and into the woods. And Philip heard two shots fired. Philip actually tried to call or text Tony, I believe, to find out what was going on, if he was OK. And so there was a ping or a record from a phone when that happened. However long later, Tony comes walking out of the woods by himself. Philip says they got back in the truck and left. Two days later, they came back to cover their tracks. Philip said that they went back down there and they took some four-wheelers, so that way they could easily get back into the woods quicker and pull down a shack or, you know, old structure that was there, which is where their remains were, and they pulled it down on top of them. Rusty and Becky did not know Tony and Wendy, nor Dusty or Philip. He didn't know any of those, any of them. And I was very confident that he didn't know any of them. So I knew that something was going on, because why would they want to do something to Rusty if they didn't even know it? According to Philip, before shooting them, Tony had made it clear to Becky and Rusty Porter that Robert Campbell wanted them dead. They found out that Robert was the mastermind behind all of it that he is the one that contacted everybody and made the decision that he wanted them killed. Robert Campbell just couldn't let it go, and he wasn't going to be satisfied until they were out of the picture so he could do what he wanted with that property and with the farm. This whole thing appears to have come about simply because the Porters inherited property, and somebody else in the family didn't like that. In December 2012, Robert Campbell and his co-conspirators are indicted on two counts of murder. Tony and Wendy was the first ones that were arrested. And then, of course, here comes Philip. And, uh, and of course, Dusty was right in there with them because they all ran together. And so whenever they started arresting people, you think, how in the world? The magnitude for you to think was just enormous. Coming up, Robert faces trial, but do prosecutors have enough for a conviction? How do we convince a jury to convict someone who wasn't even in the state? When Rusty and Becky Porter began renovating his family's farmhouse, they thought it was the place they would spend the rest of their lives together. Instead, law enforcement believed they were murdered in a revenge plot orchestrated by Rusty's uncle, Robert Campbell. Philip Friend is the first accomplice to help authorities. For his cooperation, he receives 10 years in prison after pleading guilty to two counts of second degree murder. Philip talking really helped pull everything together. And, you know, I, I think he truly, genuinely was sorry that he was ever a part of any of it. If it hadn't been for him, there's no telling when they would have been able to have found them. And so my family and Becky's family also, we all agreed that, that it would be OK for him to get a lesser sentence. Philip's cousin, Dusty Hicks, also pleads guilty to the charges and receives life in prison. In 2013, the gunman Tony Friend admits his role in the crime. Tony Friend was a man of very few words, and he just had an attorney and pled guilty, and that was it. He was done. He said, I'll take my life sentence and go. Tony's wife, Wendy, decides to try her luck at trial in March 2014. With the evidence stacked against her, 
She is convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. With Wendy, of course, the evidence was such that she was dropped off at some point after Russell and Rebecca were taken from their home, but before the trip to Cedar Creek. Um, but she was in communication with Tony and Dusty and Philip, so she had enough, you know, participation that there was enough there for a murder first degree conviction. In July of 2016, five years after the crime, Robert Campbell's murder trial gets underway. During all the hearings and the trials, Robert Campbell always played the the little old man that everybody was picking on. That there's no way that he could do anything like this. He was he was just the innocent old man that he just wanted to be left alone. He had the perfect alibi. He was out of, not just out of the area, out of the state. And so how do we convince a jury to convict someone who wasn't even in the state of first degree murder? What the prosecution had was uh, Philip Friend's very credible account of Robert Campbell arranging to have the porters murdered. The beauty of Philip's testimony was a lot of what he said was corroborated by other evidence through phone records and everything else. Robert is the one that set the ball in motion and ordered this to happen. And because he ordered it to happen, it did happen. But for him saying anything to Tony Friend, they would still be alive. Robert Campbell wanted them killed because he said Rusty didn't deserve to live in the farmhouse. Oh, it makes me mad. On July 13th, 2016, the jury reaches a decision. Once the jury went in to find the verdict, they were actually in there for hours and ended up having to come back the next morning and continue. It took the jury, I believe, 10 hours of deliberation, and they came back with a guilty verdict. It wasn't first-degree murder. It was uh, two counts of second-degree murder. It's still enough to earn Robert two consecutive life sentences. Is it justice for taking their life? I don't know. But due to our standards today and what we, what we monitor that or what we use as justice, uh, yeah, I guess they got justice as well as it could happen. I was just happy that they caught him and that he was not going to get out. With his age and the time that they gave him, he would die in prison. And that's where he belongs. For most families, weddings are a cause for celebration. But in this case, it was the start of a blood feud that ended in tragedy. It was really a sad case, you know. They didn't do anything to deserve this. They didn't do anything to bring this on themselves. It was really just greed and his own anger about not having that control that he wanted. Russell and Rebecca were really trying to make a fresh start, and this happened. If I can put it in, in one word, it's evil. And uh, no land, no, no piece of property, no house is ever worth taking the life of, of a loved one. Mom and Rusty were married less than a year. When I think about what happened that night, I just wonder how my mom felt. Was she at peace? Was she scared? Did she know what was going to happen? They took something that did not belong to them, and a piece of me went with her that day. I will never be the same person I was. It is tough, and I, I wouldn't wish this on, on my enemy, much less anybody else. It, it's just tough to get through, but with the help of God, I'm looking forward to meeting my son and Becky in heaven.